we uh, understand on the working party from um, feedback from, from uh, intermediaries in London and indeed from other practitioners that um, it is e extremely useful for a court to be able to order a variation to say the beneficial interest, the, uh, the beneficial interest of a trust um, in a way that does not require beneficiaries to consent. So typically if there are, there might be tax consequences attaching to um, an adult beneficiary consenting to a particular variation, a potential change. Um, and so for the court to be able to make that order uh, without the beneficiary formally having to provide its consent to the court is thought to be advantageous and is said to have caused um, Bermuda uh, to have won that business um, that from other jurisdictions as a result. Now, I'm not advocating changing our law every five minutes in order to simply to win a new, new piece of business, but I think it certainly um, is right for us to be considering it and looking at the arguments um, for and against. Gilead, you said specifically you're not, your job is not to worry about some of these competitive considerations, but is this somewhere where you think there could be some value? Uh, uh, yes, indeed, and um, uh, in, in my own defence, all I would say is that a, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little <laughs> minds, so I feel free to contradict myself. I do have... You like uh, the changes you like, that's all right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, 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 I've been involved in a number of applications in Bermuda where they do have uh, quite extensive powers uh, to modify the terms of the trust. Um, and that is undoubtedly very popular and extremely useful. And in fact, Bermuda has only recently introduced a, a yet a further provision uh, which enables the courts to extend um, the perpetuity period or even remove the perpetuity, perpetuity of periods of trusts, by, uh, which is something it's been doing in the past, but it's introduced a new uh, mechanism which it's hoped will be um, easier and cheaper uh, and won't necessarily involve giving all the, all the relevant parties notice and, and um, inviting them to come along and complain. Um, that, uh, I think, hasn't, has not yet been tested, although there is a case coming up fairly shortly which uh, will invite the court to exercise that jurisdiction. Um, uh, I do think that's helpful. Um, one of the points made in the, um, uh, the consultation paper is that there wasn't evidence that uh, set laws were particularly choosing one jurisdiction rather than another because of its ability uh, to make those changes. Um, but on the basis of my Bermuda experience, what happens is that trustees, if they're in a jurisdiction where they can't uh, change, make the changes they want to, will see if they can use some power to change the proper law to bring it into the jurisdiction and then make the application to introduce changes that they couldn't have otherwise done. Mm. Um, so it's not only where the trust starts off, it may be where it comes to um, for, the, for the purposes of taking advantage of your yes. uh, greater flexibility if you introduce them. Silla, in terms of where this practically comes up, <coughs> I mean, obviously, at sort of first glance, you want the variations, just specifically the ability to have the variations that go against, despite you know, we're lacking the consent of any adult beneficiary. I mean, is that, where do you see that being helpful? Where does that come up? Well, a variety of, of circumstances. One is if, if you've got a very broad beneficial class and it just isn't possible practically um, or from a cost of efficiency perspective to gain the consent of all of the beneficiaries. Or, um, so, so when you can't get the, the beneficiary consent or, or, or when beneficiaries are not willing to consent. And that may be a situation where to do so would, would attract an adverse tax consequence or where you've got one um, uncooperative beneficiary. And so you know, those are the circumstances that that, that power might be of, of assistance. Um, and I, I accept, and the argument is well made, that if a problem arises, it may well be appropriate to consider moving the trust to a jurisdiction um, where that power um, is available. Um, but on the other hand, we won't know if we introduce that provision whether by doing so we are going to um, cause some potential clients to be concerned that so it would go the, other way. the power isn't appropriate. Um, and certainly there is, there is 
comment, looking back at some of the decisions in Jersey, um, that judicial comment, that it isn't right in principle for the court to assume that sort of power. It doesn't have, it's quite clear at the moment that the court doesn't have the power, so you know, it would clearly be a, a new, talking Steve, of Steve's categories of change, this would be a new power um, being introduced. And it's, it's a question of balance and I think balancing implications of that and looking at the firewall provisions, as, as Steve also mentioned earlier, um, we've got a robust position at the moment that the courts in Jersey um, can't um, do something amounting to what they've described as an alteration, so something that the, the trustees themselves are not able to do. Um, and if we, but they can um, provide for a variation, which is something that the trustees themselves would have the power to do. And so we've got that divide at the moment between an alteration and a variation, um, which I think has seen um, Jersey um, considered to be well placed as, as a robust jurisdiction. And so any change might would need to consider the interaction with those firewall provisions um, to make sure that we don't gain an advantage potentially on the one hand, um, but weaken um, a, a, a current position of strength.